All right, it's great to be here with you all today. Who here is having a great SOCAP? All right, I'll, I'll take that, I'll take that. Um, well, it's great to be here with you all, and Jim, it's great to get to spend some time with you. It's great to be here, yeah. Awesome. Um, so for those of you that don't know Jim, there may be some of you out there, uh, Jim is truly one of the impact pioneers who's been working in this space since well before the term impact investing was even coined. Uh, he has led a very storied and varied career as an entrepreneur, an investor, an innovator, and philanthropist. He's also a founder of Sorensen Impact Group, which for more than two decades has been working to shine a light on the white spaces in impact investing and designing solutions to address them. Uh, yeah, all right, let's go. <laughs> you know, we're the last program where we are gonna try to give you a run for your money. Um, so um, what began as a foundation, uh, the Sorensen Impact Foundation, has evolved to include an asset management business, an advisory, as well as the Sorensen Impact Center, which is the fantastic host of this, this conference. Uh, for those of you that don't know the center, it does a lot more than put on conferences. Uh, in fact, uh, it has a very wide body of work, and I kind of think of it as, as creating the architecture that our industry needs to continue to grow in a sustainable, scalable, and inclusive way, and that includes, you know, very specific, doing sophisticated research to design measurement tools and other tools that uh, we all need. Uh, the center works with other organizations, helping them achieve their impact objectives. And it also has, which I think is really cool, this, uh, thanks to Jim, a program that's been established with the uh, David Eccles School of Business at the University of Utah uh, where they have a student-run venture program, a venture fund, and they have programming that's designed to uh, mold and shape the next generation of impact leaders. In fact, are there any of those students here right now? If there are, speak up. All right, well, at any rate, it's a great bunch of students. It's a really exciting program, all of which is to say that Jim is an ideal person to be having a conversation with about where we're coming from as an industry and where we are headed. So with that, let's, let's get going. Um, so Jim, it's been three years since we've been able to get together as a community here. Um, and a lot's happened in those three years. Uh, our industry has continued to grow. Uh, we have certainly moved towards the main, more towards the mainstream, whether we're talking about Wall Street or, uh, Main Street and sort of, you know, being part of uh, the popular conversation. Uh, there is certainly more scrutiny of our sector, more scrutiny of measurement, increased calls for transparency. Uh, there is far greater awareness now than there was on issues of equity and diversity, and certainly the politicization of ESG, which um, we'll talk about in a little bit. So. What are some of your thoughts about where we stand today as an industry versus where we were in 2019, the last time we all got together? Well, <clears throat> thank you, David. I appreciate that introduction. And I have to say that it's a tremendous honor for me to be here and to see SOCAP come back after three years, uh, you know, with COVID and, and the disruptions that we face. So it's, it's wonderful to see everybody and to be able to collaborate again like we are here uh, at SOCAP. Um, I remember when I embarked on, this was before impact investing, a term had been coined, uh, how nascent and, un, and really um, Un, un, unknown and, and really not fully understood the impact investing space was. And I remember the very bold uh, prediction that we'd reach a trillion dollars 
in assets under management in, uh, in impact investing. And at that time, I thought, wow, that's, uh, from where we were, that, that seemed like a very bold uh, uh, prediction. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to see that, uh, you know, it was announced at, at, at GIN last week that impact investing has surpassed uh, a, the trillion dollar mark. We're at about one point, a little over 1.1 trillion dollars. Well, that's and, huge. Let's hear it. And, that's amazing. And so I think we've come a long way. Uh, and yet I think there's, <clears throat> we'd all agree that there's, uh, we're just kind of starting on this journey. And when you look at the total, you know, assets that are under management, um, you know, we can do a lot more sure. and we need to do a lot more in order to address the, uh, the challenges uh, of our day and really potentiate what impact investing can mean to solving those challenges. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so let's turn to the ESG controversy. We had that rousing debate, very spirited debate that kicked off the conference. It was really fantastic and, and engaging. Um, I think it just kind of underscored the remarkable velocity with which ESG has just permeated the, the political and cultural divide in our country. Um, as a, as a, just a starting point to, to just shape the discussion, what, how do you think of the difference between ESG and impact? Because a lot of our time, in, part of our time in that debate was just talking about terminology. Yeah, well, and I think terminology is, you know, part of the reason for um, the, the debate around ESG. I think uh, terms are conflated and, and often misunderstood. But clearly, in my mind, there are distinctions, and uh, ESG plays an important role. It's it's really a strategy uh, of of corporations and investors to uh, invest for not only the benefit of of the uh, the shareholder, but also taking a look at uh, you know benefits to the environment, to employees, to supply chains, to communities. Uh, to the stakeholders, so to speak. And if done right and over the long term, it will provide better returns for the shareholders. And I, I firmly believe that. And I believe that that's, that's what ESG is, uh, that's the premise behind it. Um, I think it's sometimes conflated with socially responsible investing, um, which is really more of a negative screen, which, uh, you know, values-oriented investors will decide, I don't want to invest in, it, it could be tobacco, it could be, uh, you know, companies that produce carbon. Um, and I think uh, it can also be conflated with impact investing, which uh, really is investing in businesses whose very business model or the theme of the business is addressing a social problem, but on in a, in a, a way that uh, is scalable through a double bottom line that, uh, that it has generated. Uh, and I think it's important to understand the distinctions, you know, when we get into uh, the discussions about, about ESG. So this may sound like a self-evident question, but we as a community at SOCAP, most of us are focused on impact investing and not ESG. Why are we spending so much time talking about this? Why should we be talking about this? Well, I think it, again, sometimes gets conflated. And you'll hear the, the term impact investing, you know, referring to, to, to SG. I think that, you know, that's a part of it. Um, I think at the heart of impact investing, we can address, um, you know, the, the, the challenges that we're trying to, to solve for in uh, sustainable or ESG investing. Um, and, you know, this is quite often why, uh, you know, people misunderstand and conflate the terms. That makes sense. Um, there are, though, I believe, some legitimate critiques of ESG. Um, what do you think some of those are? 
Um, and I think there are legitimate uh, concerns with impact investing. Uh, I think the most prominent one is, uh, you know, the uh, impact washing or greenwashing that um, that can be uh, employed by those that are trying to utilize uh, an investor's interest, but um, aren't really authentic and uh, don't deliver the results or that are promoting something that it really isn't. And I think that's part of the, uh, uh, the confusion and I think the controversy around ESG as well as impact investing. And it really points to the need for more accurate and authentic uh, measurement and reporting of impact and calling out you know, when, um, you know, something that may be promoted as an impact investment or um, promoted as, uh, you know, an ESG fund, uh, you know, is not really delivering on the results. I remember, uh, and I've, I've had many that have approached me with investments, but one investment where uh, a hotel was being built in, in, in Tanzania, uh, and it was a luxury hotel, uh, and they were looking for capital, um, and it was presented to me as an impact investment. And when you really drilled down, uh, it really wasn't generating the impact that was purported. Uh, and I think that we have to be careful about that as we uh, continue to promote and build this, this field hmm. that it's authentic. I think, I think another problem is the uh, proliferation of uh, different frameworks and standards uh, that have, I think, created uh, confusion. Um, and uh, they don't, don't always align with one, one another. And I think there's a real effort underway to try and harmonize the, uh, the ESG standards and, and frameworks so that uh, there's less confusion in that regard. Do you have any thoughts? I mean, clearly there is, uh, this is, SOCAP has a very big tent and there are certainly divergent views on this topic. Do you have any thoughts on how we can all work together as an industry to address this controversy, maybe correct it somehow? Um, how do you think we should do that? Well, um, I think that clearly the harmonization that I've talked about in terms of uh, reducing or eliminating confusion around measurement, around reporting, around standards is really an important one. And ultimately, hopefully, will lead to, uh, you know, better decisions as it relates to investors um, in, in what these... Uh, these products that are purported to be impact or ESG actually deliver. Um, I think that we need to realize that this space is evolving. Um, it's relatively new. Uh, it's not perfect. And uh, I think uh, dialing down the, the rhetoric, so to speak, um, I, th I believe that ESG is here to stay whether the nomenclature is, uh, it may it may change. But frankly, uh, if you look at the data, if in my own personal experience, my own uh, investments, um, the those that have taken in the risk factors that are embodied in ESG uh, have outperformed those that have not. And the data is there to show that that is the case. Um, I think we also have real problems that we face that um, will be taken or need to be taken into account in investment decisions. I mean, I have made those in my own case. I had a very interesting discussion with the uh, state treasurer of, of Utah and um, as I explained some of these, um, my own personal experiences, he, he, he gave me a very interesting question. He said, 
so do you believe in climate change? And uh, it told me a lot about where he was. Sure. Um, and <laughs> I would have loved to see the look on your face when you got that question. Yeah, <laughs> I, very I, different I, was, I was a little astonished, and I said yes. Uh, and I, I've, I've had personal experience to where you know, climate change has really affected, uh, you know, me personally in terms of in, in, you know investments that I've made. Um, and with certainly some of the challenges we're facing in the state of Utah, it's hard for me to, to see why, you, why anyone wouldn't believe in, in climate change. And I think that uh, the, the issues that we're seeing with the climate and the changes that will be made to adapt to a climate that is changing will be increasingly undeniable. And uh, you know, people that that are on the side of them not, they're not being climate change or it's a, it's a temporary, um, uh, uh, you know, conspiracy by science um, are going to look really pretty, pretty sad at some point in time. And I think that really the majority of investors are, are here and to support uh, uh, ESG and sustainable investing. Uh, the nomenclature may change. I think the, uh, certainly the, uh, uh, the frameworks on how we measure them and uh, monitor them are going to improve, but it's here to stay. I agree with you. I, I, I just want to say that I find your anecdote about your meeting quite sobering. <laughs> and, you know, gives a real window into what we need to do to address this. There some, right. we've, we're facing some real headwinds. That's right. Um, so I want to switch gears for a minute. So uh, I'll let you all in on a little secret. My buddy Jim here does not really like to talk about himself. But I'm going to try to, I have to say that his story about his own journey to impact investing, I find really inspiring. I think it might inspire some of you. So Jim, if you don't mind, um, can you talk a little bit about what drew you to impact and why you've chosen to make it your life's work? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna risk this. I mean, I've told this story before, so it may be old to some of you, but um, I'll risk telling it anyway, because I think it is really at the heart of, of my discovery and I think why we're all here. Uh, you know, I really came from a background uh, uh, as a serial entrepreneur, starting companies, growing them, investing in them, ultimately selling them, and uh, generating ultimately a return that uh, for me, I think, had been uh, I would say a successful part of my, my life. And <clears throat> I had a business that was focused on the mass market. It was a video conferencing technology. And we were out to market to raise money on this, this, uh, this business. We, were, we had invested a lot in the technology and the dot-com bubble burst and everybody went away. We had a term sheet, we were all set to go and no one was going to invest at that point in time. Everybody was afraid of the market and what was happening. And I was sitting there faced with a company that was burning cash and wondering where do I go with this at that point. And it was at that juncture that a brother-in-law that I had hired who was deaf, and I hired him because they had a hard time getting a job. And um, I wanted to see if there was an opportunity for our product in the deaf community, it was at that juncture uh, that providentially he came to me with really a new service that was being trialed for the deaf. And it was called video relay service. And it enabled the deaf to communicate with the hearing through a remote sign language interpreter over the internet in real time. And up to that point in time, you know, it was all text-based, and it was very unsatisfying and inefficient for the deaf. And we had built really a solution 
that made this experience so much better. And we made the decision to pivot from the mass market to this very targeted, underserved, deaf community. Um, and the, it was a remarkable financial success because it took off and uh, we were competing against very large telcos and we took the market share uh, and grew very rapidly. And I could say it was probably the most successful company in that it, it within less than three years, it was the largest private equity uh, you know, transaction up to that point in time in, in the state when, 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 when I sold it. But even more profound to me were the, uh, was the impact. I mean, I undeservedly was being referred to as the Alexander Graham Bell of the deaf. And uh, I didn't really understand the impact it had. Uh, and it was an aha moment because I realized that you could address a problem, a very intractable problem in society in perhaps a much more scalable, self-sustaining way through uh, a for-profit business. Uh, and at that point in time, I knew that that's really what I wanted to do. I wanted to start giving back, but I wanted to do it in a way that could really move the needle. And um, I felt like more was needed than just traditional philanthropy that we really needed to figure out how to engage much larger pools of capital and focus on models that were um, self-sustaining, that could scale much beyond um, you know, what you would typically otherwise be able to do. And this was obviously before impact investing. I looked at other sectors. I went to, to microfinance mm -hmm. next. And, and had the same experience. And then it was all about how do I help build an ecosystem to support this? Uh, and that, that led to the Sorensen Impact Foundation, the Sorensen Impact Center, and now what we're doing with the Sorensen Impact Group. That's great, thank you. You know, when I, when I hear, you know, you didn't have the chance to go into a lot of detail, but when I think of your story, you know, one of the things that I always remark upon is your own personal commitment to designing solutions and investments that are really promoting equity and diversity. Um, and I think it's all the more remarkable because you're doing it in a red state. And, you know, it kind of undercuts this notion that somehow impact is this thing that, you know, liberal elites are doing on the coasts. You know, impact can happen anywhere. And it can happen everywhere, right? No, I think the yeah. thing that I found, David, is that, and I've been involved on the policy side, impact investing as it relates to policy is really bipartisan. Yeah. Um, and that's great. We want to keep it that way um, because you're addressing issues that are very near and dear to those on the left and you're doing it in a way that utilizes free enterprise um, and is sustainable and scalable that is not drawing from the tax base to do so, per se, uh, in, in a much more innovative fashion through impact investing. And I found that to resonate, uh, you know, in, in, in on the Hill. Well, you know, along those lines, I believe that one of the great, I think you share this belief, one of the great promises of impact investing is the ability to pay privilege forward uh, and create opportunities for others. And I know that that's a huge focus of the entire Sorensen organization. Can you, I know I wanna be conscious of the time because I know everybody's anxious to go to the party, but, but can you spend just a few minutes highlighting, I think, some of the work that you're doing, whether it's from the foundation or through investments, to promote equity outcomes. Sure. I think it's really interesting. I, I think one of the things that we realize is that what we need are, are more innovative and diverse funds, fund managers, and, and products to invest in. Uh, and there's a chicken and egg problem because um, 
you know, a first time investment, uh, if you're raising money, is hard to come by. And people want to invest in third time funds, fourth time funds. They want to, uh, platforms only want to let um, these more established funds on the platform. So how do you get on the platform if you can't get started? Uh, and I think that that's a role that we see the Sorensen Impact playing. We're focused on a fund now that is addressing disability. You know, I have a real, obviously, connection with disability. There aren't any impact funds out there that are focused on disability. I don't understand why. I mean, you have to scratch your head. 20% of our population has dis some form of disability. There's tremendous opportunity as it relates to investments and, and the market for this. And that's enable ventures, right? That's enable. And that's a, you know, it's a conversation that we as an impact community haven't even had. You know, it's just kind of, we've all skipped it. Um, so what we want to do is to be able to help really smart emerging fund managers to uh, bring them out of the shadows and, and into the mainstream and hopefully have uh, a much more robust, uh, you know, selection set for investors to invest uh, for good. And it takes really, I think, working with and thinking differently uh, with new fund managers, with new innovative collaborative efforts to bring this to pass. And that's, that's really what we're focused on at the Source and Impact Group. Terrific. Um, in the remaining time, um, as we look ahead to next year, you know, where do you see the industry going? Well, I'd say that um, we, uh, we reached a trillion. We got about another 99 <laughs> trillion to, to, to go. No, I, I, I firmly believe that this will continue to grow. We need to obviously um, work across sectors and bring everybody in and engage this continue to do what we're doing and 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 build this space I, I, I firmly believe that uh, and I when I when I thought of you know ten years ago getting to a trillion that that seemed to me wow that's that's a big dream now we need to think much bigger than that we need to continue what we're doing uh, I know that your organization's already thinking about SOCAP 23 any thoughts on a call to action for all of us as we look towards next year yeah, I, I would say this, and I've heard this said in you know, different ways and, and forms, but I think everybody here, if they, if they think about what they're passionate about, really what they're passionate about, and then think about what they're really good at, I mean, what, what expertise do they have? What are they really good at? And then reach out to at least two people and find a way to collaborate and innovate while you're here, that's how you make a difference in this space. That's a fantastic call to action. Thank you so much. Thanks for spending time with us. Thanks to all of you for spending time with us. And Thank you.